Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. Not counting school libraries, there are over 200 public, academic, and special libraries in West Virginia. The state has 172 public libraries, which are accessible by the general public and funded from various public sources. The state's 33 academic libraries serve West Virginia's colleges and universities. Special libraries are found in a wide variety of places, ranging from medical centers to law libraries to historical societies. Today, we're going to visit one of these special libraries, the West Virginia Division of Culture and History's Archives and History Library. I had a chance to pay a visit and found that it is one of West Virginia's best kept secrets. With me now is Archives and History Librarian, Susan Scoris. Susan, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for coming to visit us. So tell me about the mission of this library. The West Virginia Archives and History Library is the way the public accessions the collections of the West Virginia State Archives. Uh, the contents of this library and the archives belong to the people of the state of West Virginia. And uh, most of the collections are not something that most people would be able to uh, interpret or, or find what they want by themselves. So the library and its staff are the way that people access the collections. Describe your collections for me. Archives in the library collect everything by and about West Virginia and West Virginians. Now, quite obviously, we can't hold all of that. Our space is limited. But we do our best to, uh, to call out the most vital things and uh, save them for the future. Most public libraries will, uh, as they call it, weed their collections. If a book's not checked out for a few years, then uh, it's taken off the shelf and replaced by something new. You don't do that? No. We pull very few things out of the collection. Uh, most of the time, it's something I found that was taken in years ago that probably shouldn't have been part of the collection to begin with. Very rarely we'll find something that's not being used much anymore because its contents are readily accessible online. And we may choose to uh, remove that to make room. Other things, we will not only keep one copy, but we'll keep as many as four or six copies. We will keep every edition of, say, a West Virginia history book so that we can track the changes uh, in the history books over time. Um, we hold on to old magazines. We have the uh, anything we can get hold of that's published in West Virginia. Um, of course, we have the state document publications, such as Wild Wonderful West Virginia, uh, Conservation News, and, and that type of thing. I was just looking uh, over one of the other tables beside us, uh, reading a 1884 Wheeling Register front yes. page. And yes. so you have newspapers from a long yes. time ago. The, the vast majority of the collection is on microfilm. We subscribe to every newspaper in the state of West Virginia and we preserve them on microfilm and have been doing that for many years. So describe the process that patrons, historians, researchers would use to access the collection here. Um, the simplest way is to walk in the door. Uh, we're ready to, to help, and we have a wide variety of experience and knowledge on our staff, including uh, knowledge of specific collections. But um, we have um, an online catalog, and we retain an old card catalog, but that's basically because it's built into the wall, so <laughs> it's still there. But uh, you can search the catalog online to see what we have before you come. There are also various finding aids for the different collections that are searchable on the computer. We still have the old notebooks on paper with the same information, but uh, it's very handy for people to see what we have and plan their research before they come. I guess one of the primary differences between uh, a library like yours and a public library is you're not checking things out and taking them home. No, uh, we do not circulate any materials at all. Who uses the items in your collections? Who are the kinds of people that are looking for the information that you uh, have? Basically everyone. Uh, we have people come who are interested in their family history and want to research it. 
We have people who are not particularly interested in researching their whole family history, but they need to find a certain document. Uh, there are many people now who need to find records that they don't have on hand, you know, involving their parents and that type of thing in order to get passports or prove identity for other reasons. They have to have certified documents, which we can't provide here, but quite often uh, the county courthouse or perhaps even the health department is not able to find what they want and we're able to locate it, then they can take that uncertified document back to the original agency so that the agency can find it and certify it. How do you acquire the items in your various collections? I'm sure there are different ways of getting the items. What the, how do you get them? Uh, we don't purchase very much because the archives has always had a very limited budget, but um, a great amount comes by donation. How has technology changed how you operate? In very good ways and in very bad mm. ways. Um, the bad way is that far too many people assume, especially for family history, that everything they want is online. Um, they're not truly educated in how to perform research and don't realize that what's available in the online databases is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, very few West Virginia newspapers are included in the online databases, and if so, it's mostly the very old ones. And as I said, we subscribe to every newspaper in the state up through today. Susan, this is a large library. I believe it takes up four floors of the Culture Center here in Charleston. We're in the reading room. Can you give us a tour of this facility? Sure. So Susan, uh, show us around the reading room. Okay. As I mentioned before, the library includes the most used parts of the collection. We have family history books. We have transcriptions and indexes of county records. Uh, we have some information for the states that adjoin West Virginia because any place there's a bridge or a place to uh, ford the stream, people are mm -hmm. going to go back and forth over it over the mm -hmm. years. We have, uh, of course, a heavy emphasis on the Civil War, Civil War history, mm -hmm. the men who fought the war, and different ways to research that information. Mm -hmm. And we have a large collection of county histories, sometimes of an individual town, but mostly county histories. Um, we have here a lot of Virginia because a lot of people who uh, populated what became West Virginia were originally from Old Virginia, mm -hmm. and also a large collection of the newspapers. The, these are the most recently received ones. Uh, we have publicly accessible computers over here. And we have examples here of both our older microfilm machines and of the newest technology, which are digital film mm -hmm. viewers and scanners. And we have an additional room in the back that is uh, full of different types of readers and also houses our microfilm collection. Mm -hmm. We have a reference section here uh, for the librarians working at the desk. It is quite often easier to turn around and grab a book off the ready reference shelf to answer a question, uh, especially a question on the phone, than it is to search for that same information on the internet. Um, there's an entire collection of blue books here, and there's a lot of information in the state blue books. Uh, here's a collection on immigration. We have uh, separate little special collections on Native American history and genealogy and African American history and genealogy. And a big section on uh, Revolutionary War patrons. Uh, we have quite a few people who are researching their own history for, to belong to lineage societies, such as the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, the SAR, um, and that type of thing come here to get information for their applications. Uh, you will see a lot of boxes and folders on our tables and on our carts and people working on those collections. Those are things that are brought down from the closed stacks for people to use in this room. A lot of information in this room, but this is just the tip of the, of the iceberg, right? This is the publicly accessible part. Uh, there, as you said, there are three other levels where there's uh, you know, all different types of collections. There are some books even that are not kept in this room. There's a lot more to see. We're gonna take a break and we'll be right back after this. Uh, 
We're now downstairs in the lower level of the Archives and History Library, and with me is uh, Deborah Bashan. Deborah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you are in charge of let's see, special collections, manuscripts, photos, and state records. Yes. That's that's quite a bit. Yes. Tell me about them. Well, the collection dates back really to 1890 when the Western New Historical and Antiquarian Society was established, and then in 1905 the Bureau of Archives and History was created as a state agency, and so. We've got a lot of older materials, but we've also got a lot of, uh, we're trying to get more recent materials. Um, I think probably one of the older things we have will be some of the land grants that, for the different properties here and what become West Virginia. Uh, and we come up th <clears throat> through the Tomlin administration. We have the papers of Governor Tomlin, who just left mm -hmm. office in January. Um, we've been getting in some World War II era things as that generation, unfortunately, is dying off. Folks are starting to donate collections of letters, photographs and things of relatives that served in the war. And we've been working recently with public broadcasting on the Vietnam Project. So that's also brought in a few things to the collections. What are the, uh, what's, what's the oldest documents you have in here? We have something, I think, from about the 1660s that William Penn wrote. Founder of Pennsylvania? Founder of Pennsylvania. And why it ended up in this collection, I'm not really sure, except that I think it probably was one of the first things they had in the collection <laughs> when you used to collect sort of what they called cabinets of curiosities. People, famous people's signatures and things, whether in that case they had anything to do with West Virginia or not. So special collections, how do they differ from the archive records that you have? Well, the, the state records, which we tend to call the archives collection, are state government, county government records, um, ranging from you know, small boards and things all the way up through the governor. Uh, I think probably the largest collection we have in there is um, about 835 boxes of Supreme Court case files old Supreme Court case files. And then um, we have the manuscript collections, which tend to be papers of individuals, of businesses, of organizations. We have uh, the Black Diamond Girl Scout Council. We have, uh, I'm working now through some things from some of the early salt manufacturers down in Malden because we're gonna be doing a small display on that. And all the way up through Senator Jennings Randolph's papers which is a little under a thousand boxes that we are close to having finished processing after quite a few years. <laughs> it's been a big project. So uh, these are a lot of old documents, old manuscripts, old photographs. Yes. Uh, what kind of special care do you have to take when you're handling them? Well, we, we try to unfold as much as we can so that it doesn't continually be folded and unfolded because they'll have a tendency to want to break along those fold lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, we try to put things into acid-free folders, acid-free boxes, uh, larger format things like blueprints, for instance, which are in our special collections, one of those type things. We try to put those flat into map drawers, into flat file cabinets. If I'm a researcher, how do I utilize these collections? Well, we're going to suggest that if you haven't looked at some of the finding aids we have on our website, that you take a look at that. Uh, sometimes it's a case of coming in, explaining to us what it is you're trying to look for, and then two or three of us getting together and trying to figure out what do we have in one collection versus another. Um, that's why we suggest folks that are coming in to do research get in touch with us ahead of time to be sure that we've had some time to think about it and that sometimes the right person's going to be here on the day they're coming. What's your biggest challenge? Space. I need more space for collections. I'm really running out of room. Thanks, Deborah. You're welcome. Now let's check out the audiovisual collection. I'm joined now with Dick Faust. Uh, Dick, you handle moving images and sound, right? Right. So what does that entail? It entails keeping up with a lot of formats. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, 
we were just talking uh, earlier about uh, a movie that I hadn't uh, had finally gotten around to transferring to MP4, and it was a 1937, I think, 37, 38 movie uh, made by the same gentleman that made uh, Charleston Beautiful on the Canal, London Wills. So you deal with old film and uh, 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 old uh, radio recordings or audio recordings. Uh, so tell me about a typical day for you. Well, I uh, recently we finished up helping with the uh, uh, public broadcasting Vietnam piece, and mm -hmm. uh, that was all. You know, that was pulling uh, news film and uh, transferring it to MP4 because now all the old transfers we did 20 years ago are not good enough anymore. They need to be something approaching high definition. Uh, so we we've tried to keep up in that respect, and it does look better. Mm -hmm. If someone had told me years ago that. You know, you need to transfer film to high definition. I'd say, what are you crazy? It's a standard <laughs> def format. Why do you do that? But yet, if you transfer it to high def, mm -hmm. it looks better. You see things you didn't see before. And so it's kind of amazing. Well, let's talk about the changes in technology. How long have you been here? Since 1982. So you've been here a while. Yeah. And in those 35 years or so, how has technology affected what you do? Well, 1982 is an interesting year because it was the last year, I think, WSAZ, their news department, recorded only two stories on 16 millimeter film. So they had just completed the transition to three quarter inch videotape. Uh, within, oh, I don't know, several years, they went to beta, professional beta videotape, beta SP. And, uh, you know, now they're shooting all on cards and it's all, uh, it's all digital. So it's, it's gone uh, a long way. It's many different, several different formats. How difficult is it? trying to make those switches from year to year even. It's, uh, we have to keep the machines. So we have machines everywhere and much to uh, our displeasure sometimes as they get in the way, but you need them. Yeah, right behind you is, is an older older machine. The one inch video is yeah. behind us and uh, that still works. Uh, and that came from public broadcasting so we can still do that transfer in house. We cannot do two inch video in house. Mm -hmm. We never could. It was mm -hmm. just too complicated for us. So we have to send that to a professional lab. So how many different kinds of equipment pieces do you have? Oh my, we have to have one for every format. And uh, so we have a, several three quarter inch decks, several, one, actually one beta deck that'll play beta mm -hmm. or uh, another one that's a, a type of beta, digital beta. And so we can transfer those to uh, in mini DV, and then we can capture those onto a computer system and transfer them to MP4. So that gets into keeping files yeah. separate. How far back do your your audio and film recordings go? Okay, I was just thinking about that. The earliest one is a film of Nitro, which uh, Bill Wentz found for us in the National Archives, and we've got a copy. That's unusual. It doesn't happen uh, very often. So that one uh, is uh, 1918. That's Ooh, one wow. of the earliest ones. How about some of your audio tapes? Uh, audio recordings uh, go back to discs, and uh, I think there's a 1933 uh, recording of uh, Governor Kump at, mm -hmm. uh, opening the World's Fair, and that's on aluminum disc, which is you have to play with a wooden needle. So that that's, gets kind of difficult. Wow. The discs... Uh, give way after the war, after World War II in the 50s to uh, real, real tape. Dick, what's the most challenging part of your job? Keeping up with the different formats. And uh, now it's it's going to be with the digital, it's going to be keeping track of where you put them, what you call them in, in the digital files. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's going to be the biggest challenge, I think. Dick, thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll be back with more on Libraries Today right after this.
A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. I'm joined now by archives historian Mary Johnson. Mary, thanks for being with us. You're welcome. Good to see you. Well, we're now in the lower level of the library in front of a safe. What is it used for? It's actually where we can store our digital media. You know, everything is going digital nowadays. Mm -hmm. So as we have collected materials in the archives that are digital, uh, we're developing this electronic records program, and this safe is designed to, well, keep the media safe. <laughs> so in case of any kind of natural disaster, these things will be fine. It is makes things... Um, less prone to be affected by flood, by fire. It gives you that longer period of time. And the additional factor, because mm -hmm. if you notice, there's that nice little keypad where I have to put in a code. It also keeps other people from accessing media. With digital records, you have to worry about mm -hmm. the integrity, the authenticity of those records mm -hmm. more so than with other kind of records. And you work a lot with the digitalized uh, versions of these manuscripts and such. Yeah, they're, not, they're often, at this point, we're not dealing a lot with manuscripts. One of the big things that we had come in that sort of precipitated us trying to get a, an electronic records program started was Governor Manchin's photos. Hmm. The two hard drives, two external hard drives of photos that were not in any other form but digital. So that brings me to the question that the, the, the digital photos and manuscripts and documents are safely stored in the safe behind us. Yes. What about all the other documents and photos and manuscripts you have in the archives? How are they protected? Well, we have those on other floors as well as some here in this area. And we have them on shelves in boxes, acid-free boxes, and that's one level of protecting them from the elements. But in case of a, a natural, uh, you know, an emergency or a natural disaster, mm -hmm. some of those would be lost. It's possible. Uh, you know, people, they need to think about water damage or, heaven forbid, other kinds of damage. It can be pest or mold, any of those kind of things. And one of the things you, you saw, I'm sure you filmed the plastic up on, on one of the upper floors to keep those areas uh, somewhat protected from any leaks that might happen in the roof. Right. Now, most, uh, in fact, most of the collection in the archives and history library are found in the stacks on the third and fourth mm -hmm. floor of the Culture Center. Uh, tell me a little bit about those. Well, for what would traditionally be considered a library. We have rows of books. We have a few books down on the main level where people come into the library, but most of the books are actually upstairs in the stacks area, and the library staff have to pull those for patrons. Right, so the process, if I come in and I want, I happen to see a couple of John Brown's letters up mm -hmm. there, and I needed those for research purposes, what's the process that that you guys go through to get that to the researcher? Well, because that's a manuscript, mm -hmm. which we also have upstairs, there's a, a blue form that patrons have to fill out with some information mm -hmm. and a little call slip to request that those items be brought down to the library for them to view. If it were a book, it would be a white slip. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, I, you know, one of the things when I had a chance to go up and take a look at the stacks, uh, uh, it was fascinating to me, mm -hmm. uh, and most members of the public are never going to get to see that, but the thing I kept thinking as I was walking through there, and this I guess would be close to your heart, is this is a historian's dream, to be up there and surrounded by all of that. Oh, absolutely. You know, these old documents, some of them may not be quite so old, but where you've got original documents, the actual words that someone wrote 
or maybe if it were a speech, this, you could imagine somebody delivering this in front of a group of people. You know, and, and so it's their words communicating the, the story to us. It's fascinating. Yes. Mary, thanks for your time. You're welcome. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back with more on Libraries Today after this. The West Virginia Library Commission encourages lifelong learning, individual empowerment, civic engagement, and an enriched quality of life by enhancing library and information services for all West Virginians. For questions or comments regarding topics on this show, please do not hesitate to call us at 1-800-642-9021 or visit us online at www.librarycommission.wv.gov. To keep you updated on library happenings in the state and beyond, the West Virginia Library Commission uses the WVLC website, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel, and the Library Lookout newsletter. If you haven't liked us or followed us on social media yet, please do. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. The West Virginia Division of Culture and History's Archives and History Library is a researcher's dream. Its collections go back to the 1600s, and besides manuscripts and photos, there are old films and recordings and collections that historians can utilize for the work of studying and chronicling the history of West Virginia. It's a fascinating place and well worth a visit. I'd like to thank my guests, Susan Scorus, Deborah Basham, Dick Faust and Mary Johnson of the West Virginia Division of Culture and History's Archives and History Library. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.